Adams Oshiamole was earlier this week removed from office as a national chairman of the All Progressives Congress on the orders of a federal high court in Abuja, Nigeria's capital. 24 hours later, another court in the northern city of Kano delivered a counterjudgment on the same matter and enjoined all the parties to the originating suit to, in its own words, maintain status quo ante bellum. End of quote. We are going to look at all the issues relating to this case now with Dr. Moise Banire, a former national legal advisor of the All Progressives Congress, who is in our London studio. But before we come to him for his reactions, let's first of all listen to Adams Oshomale's reaction to the ruling of the courts that removed him and some other issues affecting the running of the party. It is right law that when you sue a federal agency, FCT High Court has no jurisdiction to entertain it. Number two, the purported uh, suspicion of my person by my word, first, is not even true. And I'm going to give you a document to that effect. Number three, I am not an officer of my word. I am the national chairman of a national party elected at a national convention by over 7,000 delegates. So how could nine persons sit down somewhere and purport that they have removed a national chairman? And the court, contrary to all logic, all judicial precedent, find comfort in granting uh, an interim uh, inter interlocutory order to stop me from functioning pending when the matter is determined. In other words, he has given the order without the facts being laid before him. And in the process, I joined the case to 7th of April. The calculations are clear that between now and April 7, my opponents in the system would have had ample time to do all the mischievous plans they have in place to destabilize the APC. Well, we're now joined Dr. Moise Banere, who is uh, already in London at our right studio in uh, London. Dr. Banere, good morning, and welcome to the morning show. Good morning, good morning sir. sir. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I don't know whether you listened just now to uh, uh, the uh, chairman of the uh, All Progressives Congress, your party, responding to latest developments uh, in the party. Uh, namely his uh, alleged uh, suspension by an FCT high court. And he raised a number of issues about the circumstances leading to the suit, his, uh, his, uh, the jurisdiction uh, of the uh, Federal Capital Territory High Court. And then he was talking uh, some points of law. I don't know whether he has a competence in that regard. But, you know, I'd like to draw your attention to a piece you wrote after the, uh, just before the Bayesa case. Uh, what you called the Bayesa conundrum. And uh, you had made a point about the lack of internal democracy uh, in the All Progressives Congress. And uh, you even suggested uh, in your concluding paragraphs that you think that uh, the leadership of the APC, as currently composed, has outlived its welcome if that party uh, is going to survive. What do you think is the way forward for the APC, uh, considering some of the statements that uh, embattled National Chairman Adam Sushomole has been making. The comment by the uh, chairman of the party. Well, let me say that, honestly speaking, to a large extent, in as much as I will refrain from commenting on the matters before the two courts right now, uh, all I can say is that, as far as I know, that uh, the earlier order given by the FCTI court, wrongly or rightly, ought not to be discharged by the other court. But because I haven't read the judgment of the Kano FCT uh, Federal High Court, I might not be able to comment because the reporting at time could be 40. But I know that the only way that order could have been vacated would have been by way of appeal. But the truth of the matter is that in terms of the substance of the matter, because it's soft judice, I might not be able to say so much about it. But the truth of the matter is that the entire thing boils down to the issue of the rule of law, particularly within the party, the compliance with the party constitution, which the court over time have been warning 
political party to continuously adhere to. But in this instance, like I said, I'm constrained largely from commenting so much on what the situation of the constitution of the party is vis-a-vis -vis the, both the suspension at the world and the court suspension. But um, pending the final determination by the court, I think the reality, in my own view, beyond even the various suspension, is that there is a major challenge within the hierarchy and the leadership of the party presently. Thank you, sir. So let's, if you can't talk about the case, let's talk about the internal democracy of the APC and its obvious limitations. You refer to the Constitution. Article 13 of the APC's Constitution vests power to elect or remove national officers of the party in the national conventions. Article 2 of that Constitution establishes the supremacy of that Constitution. And you have a disciplinary procedure, which is described in great detail in Article 21B of how a disciplinary committee should be constituted, how that can travel all the way to the National Convention, at which point decisions are binding on all the parties. Yet there appears to be scant faith in this process, clearly delineated as it is, because APC's members seem to rush to court. What is the problem here with the internal structure within the party? Uh, the truth of the matter is that it's true there is such a position in the APC constitution, but the court have said that, of course, that part of their constitution, that particular provision is unconstitutional, and uh, it fetters access to court. So to that extent, to, it has been declared unconstitutional. So it's as good as the dead provision in, our, in the APC constitution. So the implication of which is that an agreed member of the party can assess the court without necessarily exhausting any domestic remedy again. Thank you, sir. Now, still on the notion or still on the matter of internal party democracy, and I mean, there are so many issues here, mainly simply because, of course, the APC is our ruling party. How does this, how does this affect upcoming elections this year? We even have elections in Edo State as well this year, and how does this affect the elections even in 2023? Well, you know, the question of internal democracy within the APC has been a major challenge for, some, for a long time, let me put it that way. And it's an issue that I've agitated in several fold. Uh, undoubtedly, it has caused the party so much in recent time, in fact, in a very, very embarrassing manner. And uh, up to now, to a large extent, I would say to you that uh, the same lack of internal democracy is still haunting the, body, the party badly. Uh, Apart from Sampara, we saw what even happened in uh, River State. It, uh, even in uh, Bayesa, you cannot rule out what has happened there, particularly when it comes to the matter of screening. You see, what has happened largely under this administration is that there has been um, a major violation of the party constitution in several regards, particularly right from internal democracy to even the issue of constitution or composition of bodies and procedure and processes. And I can give you several examples. For example, I know as a matter of fact that the last, during the last uh, primaries done in 2019 or uh, thereabout, uh, the party chose to adopt in one breath in, in direct primary for some state and in other state direct primary which again is against the tenet of the Constitution and even the Electoral Act itself. A party must adopt a uniform method in the conduct of its primary. But because, of course, of the manipulation of the internal processes, particularly in terms of internal democracy, when it comes to the issue of nomination of candidates. Now, where they like your face and they believe or the sense that indirect primary will favor you, they will say, for you, we will adopt internal democracy. On the other side, if you are the one that they disnack and they know that that will not be favorable for you, they say it's the direct uh, uh, primary. These are some of the aberration. The tenet and the purpose and the uh, essence, the objective of the party constitution and the electoral act in respect of internal democracy, particularly when it comes to nomination, is to have a uniform methodology to prepare a level playing ground. For to all you. the contestants across the world and across the country. But of Do course, Dr. Barre, that... sorry to interrupt you. We need to take a short commercial break. 
When we return, the conversation will continue. Please stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. We're still with Dr. Moise Banire from our London studios. He was a former national legal advisor to the All Progressives Congress. Sir, before the break, you were talking about various inconsistencies and violations. You listed quite a few. But according to the national chairman, as he still remains, um, Adams Oshomole, 7,000 delegates voted for him, so a court cannot remove him, neither can APC Edo State. What is your take on that perspective of his? Well, it is interesting that the chairman can uh, purport to be stating the position of the law and wanting its applicability. As far as I'm concerned, like I said, the issue touches on the substantive matter before the court, and as a lawyer, <coughs> I regard it as being sub so I might not be able to say more, but I know as a matter of fact that the same allegation he's making now is the one that himself has been perpetrating in office as the chairman. I will give you a good example. Recently, I read on the social media that some appointment I made of national officer. Of course, that is inconsistent. It can never be correct. If you look at Article 20 of the party constitution, for example, it talks about the fact that all national officers of the party must be democratically elected via the convention after nomination under Article 31. Too. But what is being done now, of course, is totally it's an infraction of the constitutional provision. The same manner, again, you will realize that not quite long, maybe about a year or so, a few months ago, this same chairman presiding over the National Working Committee purported to have suspended uh, two governors as members of the party. And uh, I think the deputy national chairman and one other person. These are complete constitutional aberrations. So if you have chosen to continuously violate the constitution, I'm sure that it does not lie morally in your mouth to start complaining about somebody else violating the constitution. Of course, if the interpretation of the FDO people is that, look, you register with us so we can deregister you or suspend you. Well, the court will determine the propriety or otherwise of that argument. But the reality is that being a national officer truly is quite distinct from being a member of the party. There are two different things. But when you look at our Article 31 of the APC Constitution, it tells you that, of course, for you to be a national officer or to even be a, an officer of the party at all, you must first and foremost be a member of the party. So the question is, if, for example, you are suspended as a member, can you continue in the light of that to be the national chairman? That is an issue for the determination of the court. From my perspective, is that I am not there, depending on the school of thought or your own view. But I believe that basically what is the genesis of all this crisis is the lack of adherence to the rule of law and the constitution of the party which has become part and part of it, has become an habit, and is now haunting the body badly. And as predicted earlier, I only hope that if an emergency surgery or rescue is not done, that might be the end of the party itself. Well, it's certainly a worrying situation. And yes, you're right, lack of adherence to the rule of law and lack of adherence to the party constitution are both huge problems here. And I'd like to bring us up as well on this entire notion of conflicting court orders that we're also seeing and how this affects the judiciary or the image of the, of the judiciary, rather, when you have two courts of that status, of course, conflicting each other. What, what effects or what ripple effects, rather, does this have? If you ask me from my own personal perspective, honestly speaking, and I've said so some few weeks ago, the chairman should honorably step aside if it is to even save the party. And I will explain why. The reality of the matter is that where there are allegations here and there and your, your legitimacy is being challenged here and there all over the world, the honorable thing to do is to first and foremost step aside. And it's not new. Allegations were not made against me sometimes ago by EFCC. I read on the social media an allegation by somebody. I volunteered to step aside and equally approach the EFCC myself. Nobody asked me to go to say this is my case. So if the word 
For example, is purporting that he has committed grievous misconduct against the party constitution and some other allegations, and they have petitioned all the way through the local government, to the state, to the national body. It's just fear, normal, and the proper thing to do for him to step aside, particularly in the earning of that petition. But where, for example, you ignore or you prevented or concluded on your own volition that such petition is not worth being considered, then you already infringe on the, not only the right of hearing of the petition itself, but equally you have been a judge in your own cause. So for me, where you now have the two conflicting decisions right now, I would rather want a situation that one is saying, I don't know about the second one because I've not really read the content because I'm personally shocked if it is true that the Kanu F uh, Federal High Court made out of that, which I doubt very much, particularly if it's aware that a similar order has been made, then I'll be extremely very shocked. But as of now, the two elders, if, they, so if the second one exists along what has been purported to convey, then it then implies that the two of them are extant. So it's like choosing one or the other now. And the implication is that, for example, if the police will now be at the middle, in one respect there is another saying police should prevent him, there is another that say police should allow him. So it's now a free for all market. So if he goes there, if there is the other side, they can equally go there, and that is invitation to anarchy. But in any case, keep off the secretariat of the administration for now. Otherwise, we continue to even endanger the nomination of the potential candidate of the party because the position is neither here nor there. Now there are two others now of court of coordinate jurisdiction. So it does. It endangers the nomination process of the forthcoming election. That is my personal view of the matter. So I would rather want to see a situation where there is an emergency neck of the party, where they will resolve the matter in a manner that somebody that can validly assert and sign and endorse the candidature of candidates that will emerge eventually from the primary will be valid. Otherwise, I do not in the interest of the party, advise that it continues to stay there, notwithstanding the second order. Well, Dr. Bandera, we have just about two minutes to go, but I would like you to comment quickly on the role of lawyers and the way politicians generally have conducted themselves, and then the image of the judiciary. In the light of some of the interesting and rather controversial uh, cases that we have had relating to election petitions in recent times, uh, one you know, uh, some characters going to uh, picket the home of a justice of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court having to tongue lash and uh, find very senior lawyers. And then even in the uh, Imo case, you know, the Supreme Court just barely restrained itself from descending on the counsel. What do you think? What is the implication for the image of the judiciary and for the democratic process? Well, it depends. Let me first uh, state clearly that by the Constitution of Nigeria today, the APS court decision is final, except for the correction of clerical or other typographical errors. The, situation, the narrative I always give is that if, for example, Supreme Court says today, look at you and say, hey, Dr. Riba Dabati, you are declared a woman. For the purpose of that decision, you are a woman. And there is to be this rule under the laws of power that your boss is always right. And even where your boss is not right, you apply rule number two to say that your boss is always is right. So the message I'm trying to pass across is simple, is that if the Supreme Court, for whatever reason, is even wrong, let's assume without even considering that they are wrong in those decisions, the reality is that that decision has been taken. It can only be corrected in the future in another similar or identical situation. Otherwise, it will be an invitation to floodgate of reviews. That's number one. Number two, again, is that if you know the circumstances under okay. which this human being, this judge thesis of the Supreme Court operate, there cannot but be errors. 
unfortunately, you have a situation where you have about 11 to 12 Dr. justices of the Supreme Court as opposed to 21 compliments. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.